Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are, strengthen our Redeemer. Amen. There is an alternative Old Testament reading in our lectionary for today, um, and I want to read that for you as well, and that comes from Exodus chapter 20. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven or above or that is on earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance. And said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. If you look up the word power in the dictionary, you will find a number of definitions. It's kind of like the word run. It just goes on and on and on. There's a lot of definitions because it can be used as a noun, it can be used as a verb, it can be used as an adjective. But there's four meanings particularly that I wanted to lift up today for the purpose of the, of the sermon and the gospel. Power is the ability to act or produce an effect. It's possession of control, authority, or influence over others. It could be a controlling group like an establishment. It can mean political control or influence. <clears throat> One of the most important things that we need to remember about power, though, is that power is not good or bad, like we heard in the children's sermon. Power itself is neutral. There are circumstances in my life where someone might have more power than me that are really good. I'm really glad they have more power than me. And then there are some circumstances where that's not so good. And conversely, the same can be said for when I have power. Sometimes it's really great that I have power, but if I don't know what I'm doing, it's probably not a good thing. We could say power is good because it gives us an opportunity, an opportunity to act or influence things. But we could also say that power is bad because it's real easy for power to take over in our lives and for us to want to seek more and negatively influence us. Scripture as a whole is full of stories about power. Our lives and our relationships are governed by power and by authority. Parents, bosses, teachers, the president, all of these different roles that have power over other people. And we depend on order to live in a society that is peaceful. We need authorities. We also need rules or law like the Ten Commandments and people to help enforce those rules. Authority is important in making sure the rules happen. Various authorities have varying levels of power, but again, that power is neither good nor bad. What's good or bad are the things we do with it, the way we use power in our relationships and in our roles in life. So because we believe God has the highest power as our creator, God used that power to give us the Ten Commandments to help govern us and instruct us on how to live in right relationship with one another. What God did with power was for love. And then God sends Christ into the world because it became apparent that we couldn't love completely even with the law to help us. Christ says over and over in the Gospels that he has come to fulfill the law. 
He's not come to show might and power, like Pastor Steve talked about in his sermon last week. You know, Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey. But rather, Jesus came to show power through love. Everything Christ did was to use his power for love. And so we come to today's parable. There are several key roles in this story. The landowner, who would obviously have the most power in the situation. The tenants, who were given power to run the land while the owner was not there. Um, The slaves or servants that come to gather what the tenants have and bring it and share it with the rest of of who needs it. And then um, the son, who has kind of had authority by his father, but had maybe more power over the tenants, right? So it's not hard to follow then where Jesus places the different people that he's speaking to in the story. God being the landowner, the leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the people that God had put in charge in the, in the laws of the, the, the Israelites and the Hebrew laws, God had put certain people in charge to help maintain order and peace. And then there's the followers, those that lived out their faith, and then finally the Son, Christ. So in this story, what does this teach us? It shows us that God loves through peaceful opportunity. He sends slaves, he sends servants to come gather, he sends the Son. So God shows love through peaceful opportunity, but those who mistake their power as higher than God's will find themselves no longer followers of God. Of course, now you can imagine how the Pharisees would have responded when hearing this story. They were not too happy. They didn't like it one bit because they're being painted out here. God, you told us that we were in charge, and now you're telling us that we shouldn't be in charge because we do bad things, that we're killing off the people. But as with last week's gospel, these leaders find themselves in a bind once again. They know that Christ has a lot of power and a lot of followers, so they're afraid, but they also don't want to lose their power and, and, uh, and arrest him because they're afraid that either way, they're losing power. Either Christ has more power than them or they'll lose power if they move against him. It's in all of this trouble that it causes me to wonder There's always the Pharisees that I believe probably thought that they were doing the right thing and were confused and worried that why is this guy telling us such different things? What do we do with this? We don't understand. But I also think there were probably many who saw their power threatened by Jesus Christ and what he was saying and that they responded ultimately in fear of losing that power. And so they began the plot to arrest Jesus. That plot starts in chapter 26 of Matthew. This is chapter 21. Jesus is in Jerusalem, and he's teaching for another three chapters or four chapters. And then everybody starts to wise up. The leaders start to wise up and think, we got to do something about this guy because he's just getting too powerful because they're too worried about losing what they have. And yet with all of this in mind, does God wish us to not have power? Absolutely not. Actually, God gives us power. God wants us to have power, but it comes down to what we do with this power that is good or bad. And so we turn to Paul's letter to the Philippians this morning. Paul points out that ultimately our power is not the best, but God's power. Paul was a, a, a big authority in the Jewish community. He was a teacher. He was very well educated. He had a position of power. He actually arrested people that weren't following the Jewish ways. He arrested new Christians and persecuted them until he meets Jesus on the road, on the way to Damascus. And it's at this point in his conversion that he realizes the only power to have is to die to his old self. The only way he has power is to die to his old sinful self and rise again with Christ to become new, 
to follow Christ, that God's power is what gives him his power. And God's power is about love. And then Paul reminds the Philippians that it's not his own gain. He didn't gain this by himself, but that it is Christ himself that gave us this power. And so with this, we press on towards the goal. <clears throat> we in our own lives have a lot of power. In fact, in our baptism, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. We, are, we make promises at our baptism. There's a lighter under there. <laughs> that was scary. <laughs> um, we make promises in our baptism, and they sound like the following. Where's my page? I keep missing it. I just have it. <laughs> Pastor Steve. That's what I thought. That's what I was on. Where am I missing it? Oh, yeah. To live among God's faithful people. To uh, bring, bring, uh, bring yourself to the word of God and the Holy Supper to follow the Ten Commandments. To learn and study the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. Read the scriptures. To be nurtured in faith. To work for justice and peace. To serve others and care for others in the world that God has made. These are the things that are promised in baptism. These are the things that when we affirm our baptism, we take on ourselves. And it's in these baptismal promises that we live out our power. Because power is not good or bad. It is what we do with it. And God calls us to use our power for the good of the world. Please pray with me. Holy God, we thank you so much for the gift of power. Thank you for sharing your power with us. Thank you for helping us to die to our old selves so that in our new selves, through baptism, we may use our power for good, that we may serve those around us, that we may show others your love, and that we may remember our relationship with you and allow ourselves to be loved and governed by you. Thank you for the gift that you give us to have authority. Thank you for the order that you give us in power. Help us to use it wisely for good. We pray this in your name. Amen.